here. I'm Mark Bauerlein, Senior Editor at First Things Magazine with another video interview. Uh, today we have Mark Movsesian, who is the Frederick A. Whitney Professor and Director of the Center for Law and Religion at St. John's Law School. He is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Uh, before starting as a professor, he served as an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel at the Justice Department and as a law clerk to Supreme Court Justice David Souter. He has written numerous articles in American and European law reviews and as our readers know, he's a regular contributor to First Things, both in the magazine and on the website. Uh, Mark, welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, first, Mark, why don't you tell us about, about this center uh, that you run, the Center for Law and Religion. At sure, St. John's. sure. Well, the Center for Law and Religion is an academic and research center at the St. John's Law School, and its mission is to focus on church and state issues, both in the United States and also abroad. Uh, in fact, much of the work that we do is comparative in nature, which sets us apart from some of the other law and religion centers here in the U.S. Uh, we have a number of programs, uh, I guess, one important program we have is that we regularly host academic conferences and public events on church and state issues both in the United States and abroad. The most recent one we did was a conference on international religious freedom or religious freedom as an international human right where Pope Francis gave the keynote. That was at our, com at our campus in Rome. But we've done events here in New York too. In fact, our next event coming up uh, this October is the start of a new project which we call the Tradition Project which is a research project that's going to look at the continuing value of tradition in today's world and also the relationship between tradition and change in democratic societies. The first session is going to be in October. Uh, we're going to gather up, I shouldn't say gather up, gather together uh, uh, scholars and leading public figures and, uh, and journalists and bloggers to talk about the subject of tradition in law and politics. Uh, the keynote is going to be given by Judge Mike McConnell, now Professor Mike McConnell, who runs the Con Law Center at Stanford, um, and that's going to take place here in New York in October. And I should say that, that the, inter the inaugural session is funded by a generous grant from the Bradley Foundation. We have further plans. In future years, we'll do programs on tradition and culture and tradition and the global clash of values. So we view this as a multi-year research project. Uh, second, we also uh, co we coordinate the Law and Religion Center, uh, the Law and Religion Curriculum, excuse me, at St. John's. Um, and principally here we host a colloquium in law and religion which brings outside scholars and judges to St. John's to teach a seminar for selected students and faculty members both from St. John's and elsewhere. And most recently we had Justice Sam Alito participate in this. We've had Robbie George, we've had Philip Hamburger, we had the late Justice Scalia a few years ago. That's been a great success. And finally we have a blog, the Law and Religion Forum. Uh, anyone who's interested, it's law and religion forum, one word, dot org, which provides regular commentary and updates on scholarship and recent cases in law and religion. You, you know, from your description, uh, it, it makes me uh, think, of, think of it actually a different question before we get into the broad issues of religious liberty and in the United States. When you look at the Center for Law and Religion, first of all, when was it founded? 2010. Okay, so, so, so it's quite new. Mm -hmm. What particular uh, need did or does the Center for Law and Religion fill that, let's say, the, the, the general law school curriculum or the general ed curriculum wasn't, wasn't quite meeting? Well, so uh, when we began the center in 2010, it was pretty evident that religion was making a comeback on the world stage, that people had dismissed religion for quite a long time as being unimportant, not something that was going to drive society in the future, and that was changing. Uh, and although we certainly have centers at law schools, including my own, that talk about constitutional law generally, there really wasn't one that focused on law and religion per se. And there certainly were not a lot of people who were looking at law and religion in a comparative basis. So much of what we do at the center is look at the way the United States treats church-state issues and compare that with the way other societies, particularly in Western Europe, treat church state issues. So the first project we did, the first research project was on separation of church and state in the US and France. And we, we, have a, we have a Paris campus also, so we did this over there. And we compared the way the United States treats church state issues with laicite, which is the French way of doing things. Uh, we've also done research projects on state-sponsored religious symbols, both in the United States and abroad. We focused on a recent case in Italy involving the display of crucifixes in public school classrooms. 
So I think what we as a center are doing that is not being done elsewhere, or not very much elsewhere, is looking at these issues which have come to the fore of Western society in a comparative basis. We're looking at the way different Western societies, different Western legal systems focus and treat these issues. So, so in, in your description, Mark, that brings us to really the meat of, of our discussion. And that is, uh, in the last few years, we've certainly seen many religious controversies uh, unfold, particularly relative to the, to the law. Uh, how does the legal landscape of religious liberty look? In, in, you know, we're, we're, and it seems to be changing every few months, but right now, we're, we're, we're in summer 2016. What, what, what do you see at the present time? So I think it's a mixed situation, actually. Uh, I think it depends a lot on the sort of issues that we're talking about, the particular issue we're talking about. But I think there are perhaps some worrisome signs for the future going forward. And, and what I mean by that is if we look at certain issues, for example, if you look at internal church governance, it seems to me that's very secure. We have a long tradition in America that churches should be able to run their affairs without outside interference. That seems pretty secure. We can talk about that some. If we move beyond that, though, to the question of religious accommodation more generally, there I think the, the picture is a lot more murky. Uh, and generally, I think, in our culture, we're seeing a shift in which uh, it seems there's now a great deal of pressure being put on the traditional American ideal that religion is special and deserves special protection under the law. That's a cultural shift, not a legal shift. But uh, of course, culture drives law in a democratic society. And so as the culture shifts, if, if we think more and more as a people that religion doesn't merit special protection, or in fact, religion may be inimical to some of our values and needs to be uh, restrained, well, then that's going to change the law, too. What are the key, uh, the key cases that have put those questions, that conflict, front and center yeah. in, in the last few years? Sure. So let me begin by saying, so uh, I'm going to try to keep things at a 30,000 foot level because the law of religious liberty can be very complicated. You know, I have colleagues who are tax professors who talk all the time about how complicated tax law is. And I think my area is pretty complicated too. We don't have an internal revenue code, but there are a lot of doctrines and sub-doctrines and exceptions that make things hard. So I'll try to keep things at a kind of, at a kind of high level. And I'm not going to talk about the establishment clause issues because those are, I think, somewhat different. And maybe merit their own conversation at some other point. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with regard to religious liberty, um, so one set of cases recently has involved internal church governance. And we're talking here about the ability of churches, and not just churches, I mean generally religious communities. I'm using that word to cover not only Christian uh, houses of worship or Christian denominations, but just generally. So this could be Christian schools. Uh, well, or, or it could be synagogues, it could be mosques, it could be anything. Okay. The idea is that, that the traditional American idea has been that the state stays out of internal church governance, that churches have the right to uh, fashion their own statements of faith, to decide how best to promote their mission, to choose the people who will represent them before the public and lead them. And that, I think, is pretty secure. That particular right, I think, is pretty secure. We had a case in the Supreme Court in 2012, a case called Hosanna Tabor. Uh, and this was a case that involved a claim by a minister from a Lutheran church that the church had dismissed her as an employee in violation of the federal employment discrimination statutes, particularly in her case, it was the American with Disabilities Act. She said they fired her because she had narcolepsy, and that would have been a violation of the federal civil rights laws. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, nine to nothing, that the religion clauses of the Constitution, the First Amendment, gave the church the right to be exempt from the federal civil rights statutes with respect to the hiring and firing and disciplining of ministers. Why? Because it's essential to religious freedom under these clauses, the court said, under the Constitution, that churches have a right to govern themselves, to organize themselves as they see fit, to fashion their own messages, to pick people who will lead them. And that is inviolable. The state cannot get involved in that even even in order to promote the interest in preventing discrimination in employment. Wasn't there a question that uh, the work she was doing was in violation of some of the doctrines of the church? Yeah, that was one of the claims in the case also, that she had apparent, she had, well, she, I was going to say she had threatened to sue them. She did sue them. And that was a violation of church doctrine also. But her main claim was that they were discriminating against her because she had a disability, which would have been a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
And the court, <clears throat> nine to nothing, said that that act simply does not apply. It's called in law the ministerial exception. Mm -hmm. Because of the constitutional protection of religious liberty, that law simply does not apply to a church's decision who will be its minister. And so, but, uh, and just before we move on uh, to other cases, I want to come back a little bit to the Hosanna Tabor case because I think that the position that the Obama administration took in that case is very telling about a political shift that may be underway. Uh, we may be seeing a shift in our politics and in our culture uh, away from our traditional view that religion is important and religion should be protected in public life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's one set of cases. One set of cases involves this, the ministerial exception and the, the idea that when it comes to internal church governance, churches really can do what they want without the interference of the state. And I think that the Hosanna Tabor case, because it was 9 nothing, I think suggests that that right is pretty secure for the time being. I, I don't think you're going to have lots of incursions into churches themselves, what their ritual is, what their worship is, who they pick to be their ministers, how they fashion their mission in the wider world. So when we move beyond the question of, of protecting internal church governance and, and as it were what happens inside the church, uh, when we move beyond that to questions of religious accommodation in the wider society, then I think situa the situation becomes more murky. So let me explain what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about situations in which someone says, I cannot comply with civil law because that would violate my religious conviction. Uh, and because I can't comply, I am, in a sense, being excluded from public life in some way. So a good example would be, and these are all real cases, a pharmacist who says, even though there is a legal obligation on me to fulfill a prescription for Plan B, which is a contraceptive that um, some people think is an abortion-inducing drug, but the pharmacist would say, as a matter of religious conviction, I think it's an abortion-inducing drug. And I think, as a matter of religious conviction, that I cannot fill a prescription for that drug because that would make me complicit in, uh, in an evil act. Um, even though there's a legal requirement that I do that, I can't do it. So um, if you force me to do that, I have two choices. Either I become a criminal or I have to give up being a pharmacist, right? Um, that's the kind of situation I'm talking about here. Or, for example, a Catholic adoption service that says, even though the law requires us to place kids with same-sex couples, we don't think we can do that uh, consistently with our religious conviction. And in these cases, the person says, I request an accommodation. I would like to be exempted from the operation of this law because it would violate my religious conscience. And you are making me violate my religious conscience as the price for engaging in my occupation or for participating in public life. That's the question I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I should say also, this is a very complicated issue. And I think conservatives need to understand this. Uh, you couldn't have a legal system in which everyone could say, I am exempt from the law because of my religious conviction. You know, I don't want to pay my taxes because it's against my religion to pay taxes to the government. You couldn't have that. You couldn't have a legal system. On the other hand, if religious liberty is to mean anything, then it has to mean at least the ability to be exempt from some laws some of the time because your religious convictions uh, forbid you from complying. So it's a complicated situation, and throughout our history, we as a country have tried to draw a line between giving too much liberty and making us anarchy, or giving too little liberty and not fulfilling the ideals of the First Amendment. So it's a complicated, it's a complicated issue. One of the things that y you said earlier was the degree to which culture is going to shape the law. And drawing the line, it seems, is very much Absolutely. the work of culture. Absolutely. <laughs> that the lawyers hold. Now, one of the ways in which uh, a culture can change is with the change in demographics. Mm -hmm. and, and you've written a little bit about this younger demographic, which is filled with the nuns, mm -hmm. as, as they're called. People who write down on, on, the, uh, on the surveys, religion, none. Absolutely. Uh, how, how do you think, well, what's your prediction for this, for this demographic? Right, it's a complicated issue. So let me, let me tell you where right now the law is on these questions, and then I can explain why, at least in my view, there are some worrisome signs for the future. So, uh, and again, I'm doing this at a 30,000 foot level. I'm sure many of your listeners know the law very well and will be able to spot that I'm leaving out some details, but I'm trying to keep it as general as I can for the purposes of this conversation. The, the basic consensus rule in America today in most jurisdictions when it comes to religious accommodation is what we call the compelling interest test. And the compelling interest test is this. It says that 
the government cannot impose a substantial burden on a person's exercise of religion unless the government has a compelling interest in imposing that burden on the person and the government has chosen the least restrictive means of doing so. So substantial burden can't be justified unless the government has a compelling interest and the government has chosen the least restrictive means. That's the standard in the federal statute called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA. Uh, it's also the standard in the majority of states either by adoption of state version of RIFRAs or by state constitutional provision and the way state courts have interpreted those provisions, the compelling interest test. Interestingly, that is not the test under the federal constitution, at least as the court has now interpreted it. Under the federal constitution, the free exercise clause, there is no right to a religious accommodation if the law is generally applicable and neutral. And this rule comes out of a case called Employment Division versus Smith from 1990. It was actually written by Justice Scalia. And the rule under the federal constitution is no accommodation if, it's a, if the law in question is generally applicable, applies to everybody, and also is neutral. So for example, if you can show that the state is actually targeting religiously motivated conduct, well then you move to the compelling interest test under the First Amendment, but not otherwise. So actually the current constitutional doctrine under Supreme Court precedent is rather more limited with, with respect to accommodation than these statutes are. In, in, in the light of history, did Justice Scalia ever express any doubts about that That's a great decision. question. That is a great question. You, you might have expected he would, because certainly by the end of his tenure, he was seeing things shift. No, as far as I know, he never did. And here's why, he, here's, what, here's what explained his reasoning. Uh, if you look at the Smith case, to my mind, there really were two things that were driving Justice Scalia's opinion. One of them was the fear of anarchy. I mentioned before that if you let everyone get out of a law because he has a religious conviction against it, then you really are courting chaos. And we really can't have that in a legal system. And I think that was one thing Justice Scalia was worried about. Second and more important, Justice Scalia was rather optimistic about the ability of religious minorities to go to the legislature and get an accommodation from the legislature. You know, all he was saying is the Constitution doesn't require the legislature to accommodate you. But we have a tradition of generosity in America. We are generous to religious minorities. And if a religious minority goes to a state legislature and says, look, um, and indeed this happened in the, in the actual case involved uh, the ingestion of peyote, which is a hallucinogenic drug. And a certain group of Native Americans, the Native American church, which is not related to Christianity, it's a Native American religion, uh, used the peyote in religious ceremonies. And they were eventually able to get a dispensation from the state to do this. So what Justice Scalia was saying is, um, we don't need to go through the Constitution. You can go to the legislature, the legislature will accommodate you. Another example is RIFRA itself. RIFRA was passed in 1993. RIFRA reinstated the compelling interest test. Okay, now RIFRA, just for, for the view, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, right. passed in, in 90... 93. 93. Good. And there are also state versions. There are state RIFRAs as well. The vote was unanimous in the House. The vote was 97 votes to three in the Senate. Or maybe 97 nothing. Maybe there were three abstentions in the Senate. Um, and so Justice Scalia could point to that and say, look, we're, I'm optimistic about this. We support religion in America. No, 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 no. And, I think, and I think that has changed. I think that has changed. But he certainly couldn't have seen that in 1990. Yeah. Where does the compelling interest issue come into play when, say, a, a gay couple goes to a conservative Catholic florist who says, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do your wedding, but there's a florist one mile away, I can refer you to that florist. But the state comes down against, against that yeah. florist. Yeah, well, so you would see in a case like that, that, uh, th that it, would work, it would work as follows. Um, the florist would say, you are imposing a substantial burden on the exercise of my religion by forcing me to do this. Because I assume we have a law that says you can't discriminate or you have to take all comers or something like this. So assuming, assuming that the court agrees that this is a substantial burden, and I think some courts may not agree. Some courts may say it's not a burden on your conscience simply to you know, sell someone some flowers. That's not a substantial burden on your religion. You know, no one's telling you you have to agree with what the person does when he buys the flowers. Assume you get past that, then the government could well claim, well, we have a compelling interest in ending discrimination and, and ending insults to human dignity. Third party dignitarian harm is a, is a thing to look out for in the cases coming up, I think. And we have chosen the least restrictive means of doing so.
So um, uh, this is why I say I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat, the, the situation is murky when it comes to religious accommodation going forward because all these tests, compelling interest, substantial burden, least restrictive means, these are all judgment calls. Mm -hmm. And because they are judgment calls, they depend a great deal on the intuitions of the people making the judgments. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, if we have different federal judges or different Supreme Court justices who are making these judgments, then you may have different outcomes. You know, the compelling interest test is what enabled the Hobby Lobby uh, Corporation to win in the Hobby Lobby case. Uh, maybe I should tell you a little bit about, about Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby is a case involving the contraception mandate under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, this is a mandate which is, uh, which is um, imposed by HHS rules, by Obama administration rules under the Affordable Care Act. And uh, the rules state that employers have to provide coverage for their employees, which, include, which includes coverage for I think 16 contraceptives, four of which are, according to some people anyway, abortion-inducing drugs. Uh, and in the Hobby Lobby case, the employer said, well, as a matter of religious conviction, I don't feel comfortable covering these four abortion-inducing drugs. And the administration took the position, well, you have to do this, because we have a compelling interest in assuring cost-free access to these contraceptives by, by your employees. And this went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided five to four, it's a close vote, and Justice Scalia was still on the court in those days. Uh, the court decided that the contraception mandate violated the compelling interest test. Why? Well, number one, the mandate, the court said, imposed a substantial burden on Hobby Lobby's exercise of religion. I should say that whether Hobby Lobby could exercise religion was itself an issue in the case. The court said, yes, this is Hobby Lobby is a person for purposes of the, the act and therefore could exercise uh, a religion. Although the court limited this to close corporations like Hobby Lobby, they're not talking about GM or something, they meant closely held, almost family corporations. Okay, it's, it was a substantial burden on the exercise of religion. Assuming that the state had a compelling interest in assuring cost-free access to these contraceptives, nonetheless, the state had not chosen the least restrictive means of doing so. And the court said, look, there are, there are other ways that the government could have assured cost-free access to these contraceptives and thereby promoted its compelling interest without forcing Hobby Lobby to pay for it. Um, that was also the issue in the recent case, this term, the Zubik case, in which the Little Sisters of the Poor and other religious nonprofits were also contesting the contraception mandate. And by a vote of nine nothing, the court sent that case back to the lower courts with a very strong suggestion that the government could find some way mm -hmm. to allow these employees to get cost-free contraception without making the nuns pay for it. So that's what, that's what the compelling interest test does. And you could say, and you could look, you could look at this and say, these have been victories. These have been victories for plaintiffs, but. Will, will Hobby Lobby have, do you think, uh, a long-term influence? Well, this depends uh, very much on who the judges are. <laughs> right, As right, I say, right. because these are, so look, Question we have. Question personnel. Yeah, well, Not largely <laughs> both, yeah, both. Yeah, yeah, because look, yeah. we have, look, in American law, we have a theory of precedent. And in theory, Hobby Lobby is binding now on future cases. But uh, the common law system is such that quite apart from overruling the case, you can cut back on it in various ways. And as I said a minute ago, uh, the compelling interest test depends on a lot of judgment calls about whether something is a compelling interest, about whether there has really been a substantial burden, about whether the government has chosen the least restrictive means. And all of these depend very much on, on the intuitions of the people making the judgments. And I should say, by the way, in the, in the Zuba case, uh, you know, most of the religious nonprofits lost their cases in the lower courts because we have now a number of judges who've been appointed by the Obama administration who don't see things the way the Hobby Lobby majority saw things. So yeah, as you say, a lot of times in the law, things follow personnel. That certainly points out the importance of the election in November. Well, sure, because uh, the next president will certainly appoint the replacement for Justice Scalia, and it's possible the next president will have other appointments as well. I mean, much of this depends on whether the justices themselves decide to retire or not, and you know, um, maybe not. Maybe they'll decide to stick it out for the first couple of years. We really don't know. But yes, obviously, uh, obviously the control of the Supreme Court is a very important question. And if I may say, not only the Supreme Court, because the lower courts are deciding these cases too. And the president will also have a choice to pick you know, hundreds of lower court judges. And that will also determine the future of these cases. Professor Movsesian, thank you very much. And we'd love to have you back. Glad to do it. Thanks for having me.